You ever do that? When I was a kid learning that trick, I used to like just tying cans to people's bumpers and I'd wait. You could hear the clinging and clanging when they drove away. Got a little older, went to friends' weddings. We do that all the time, huh? Tie all kinds of cans to their bumpers. You know, if I would have had the video up there, just the sound, I bet you would have recognized it. It's the kind of sound you remember, that clinging and clanging of those cans dragging on that pavement. I read somewhere once where someone said that growing up in a small town is like being that car. Where everywhere you go in life, you're dragging those cans, clinging and clanging behind you. All your past mistakes, your failures, your indiscretions, they're always there. Because as he said, people never forget. No matter how old you get, no matter how gray your hair gets, no matter how much you age, it's like they always see your high school yearbook. Or at least remember the things you've done. It's like you live your life dragging all of your garbage behind you. I didn't grow up in a small town. I didn't grow up anywhere. I grew up going to school. My dad was going to school to be a pastor. So my kindergarten year was where he interned. My first grade year was when he finished off school. Second to fourth grade were in Nebraska. Fifth to eighth in Minnesota. High school was Wisconsin. I have always been the new kid. But I tell you what, no matter where I went, those cans had a way of clinging and clanging behind me. You see, even if you live in a place where you don't recognize a single face, or you live in a place where you know everyone, whether you grow up in a small town or a big city, even if no one else knows about it, those cans cling and clang always for you. They sure did for Paul. You see, Paul got about as far away from his hometown as you could in the ancient world. He dropped Timothy off in a place called Ephesus, this modern-day Turkey. He goes to Greece. He goes to Israel, back to Rome. But that was his life. He was always on the move. But no matter where he went or what he did, his past followed him like cans clinging and clanging behind that car. He'd heard stories. They heard about how he had once been Saul, the persecutor of Christians. They heard about the way he had made people's lives miserable and the way he persecuted them. They heard about his violence. And they heard about how he had changed. They heard about how God found him on the road to Damascus, about the blindness and the sight, about the baptism, the new life, about how now he was dedicating his life to sharing the message that at one point he had tried to destroy. See, no matter where he went, or there's a brand new town, or whether it's the same place he'd been for a while, it's like those cans were always clinging and clanging behind him. But they always rang loudest for him. Because for them, they were just stories. But Paul lived it. You see, they heard stories about a guy who was a blasphemer, who told lies about God. But Paul, he remembered those conversations, how hard he worked to talk people out of following Jesus, and he never got those conversations back. They heard about stories about a persecutor, a guy who warred against the truth. But Paul remembered their faces. He could still hear the cries of the people he threw into prison, the screams of the family he tore apart. He could still see the faces of the people he put to death, night after night. They heard stories about a violent man, but Paul was that man. He remembered the fight and the conflict and the blood of it all and how he thrived on it. He was the worst kind of ignorant. Because he didn't grow up in a house where he never heard anything about the God of Israel. He grew up knowing his Old Testament better than anybody in this room. And yet he refused, he absolutely refused to see Jesus in it. He thought he was serving the God of Israel. In reality, he was fighting against him. See, it didn't matter where he went or what he did. Those cans always rang loudest for him. But you know, maybe Paul's not the only one. Consider what Paul says. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy 
because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Persecutor, blasphemer, violent man, acts of ignorance and unbelief, those were the cans that trail behind Paul that always rang in his ears. And so let him to say this, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But you know, maybe we could give Paul a run for his money. You see, we might not have our names in light as a blasphemer, someone who lies about God. But think of the ways in our words and our actions, we have done all we can to chase people away from Jesus instead of bring people to him. We would not be famous persecutors, people that war against the truth. But think about the people in our lives who care enough about us to tell us what God's word says and how we throw that love back in their face if we don't like what it says. We might not have had the cops show up because of our violence. But think of the ways we rip apart the people God's given us to love in our lives. Maybe we're like Paul. Maybe we grew up in a house where a Bible was always at arm's length, and yet somehow we still found a way to live in ways that seem to indicate none of it sunk in at all. You see, my point is, maybe the cans that trail behind us aren't that different from Paul's. Maybe they are. Maybe it is a totally different montage of thoughts, words, and actions that haunt us. Whatever the case, wouldn't it be nice if we could say, that's what I was? Wouldn't it be nice if we could say that we used to be the worst of sinners? But Paul does not say, I used to be the worst of sinners. Do you see what he says? I am the worst. Because... Whether we like it or not, this is true. We are at the same time saint and sinner. And when God found Paul on the road to Damascus and brought him to the faith, he didn't get to leave his sinful nature behind. It always followed him. And it always follows us. You see, oftentimes the things that haunt us aren't the things we did in high school. They're not the things we did so long ago in a different life. Wouldn't it be nice if we could say that? Because then we'd be a success story, someone who's changed. But the honest truth is it's hard to say that when you did that last night. When the people in your life live in fear, you're going to fall into it again. When you know you battle the same temptations day after day and lose more battles than you care to admit. You see, it's not that I used to be the worst of sinners. It's that I am. And oftentimes, those are the cans that cling and clang the loudest. See, week after week, we come here and we drag all that garbage in the door with us, don't we? And sometimes it clings and clangs so loud, everybody in our life can hear it because they saw what we did. They can barely look us in the eye. Other times, we're the only ones who know about it, but we can hardly look up. And still other times, we do such a good job of lying to ourselves that we believe we've got nothing to be sorry for. Do you know who always sees it? Jesus always knows. He knows every thought. He knows every word. He knows every action. And he understands them on a level we never will. He knows their true villainy. And he knows the true price that they deserve in hell in a way we can never comprehend. And yet despite that, Jesus gives us a saying we can count on. Something you can bank on. Do you see what it was? Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, 
the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. It is so easy for us to get lost in our failures, in our sins, in our indiscretions, in the things that go clinging and clanging behind us. But you see what it says there? Jesus was under no illusions about who he came to save. It doesn't say that he came to save the nice ones or the good ones or the ones who are at least a little better than those ones. Jesus came to save sinners. Sinners like Paul. Sinners like you. Sinners like me. And he did what was required. He paid the price that was needed to be paid. His life for our life. His death for our death. It's a silly kind of arrogance for us to believe that we could do anything that is bigger than the price that was paid when the price that was paid for your sin is the life of the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. I'm just not capable of doing anything that bad. You see, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you see when you look in the mirror. It doesn't matter what people say about you when you walk by. You are what God calls you. And in Jesus, God calls you forgiven like it never happened. God calls you holy as if you lived up to every demand and every law. God calls you a saint. Not because what we've done doesn't matter, it does. Not because what you've done isn't that bad, it's worse. Not because we're better than others, we're not. But because quite honestly, there's nothing we can do that's bigger than the price that was paid for it. And that makes Paul the most unlikely of things. An example. The blasphemer, the persecutor of Christians, the violent man is our example. But not the way you think. God isn't telling us to go out and try to seize the title worse of sinners from him by doing all the worst things we can imagine. It's not about what Paul did. It's about what God did for Paul in spite of what he did. You see, in spite of his history, in spite of all the baggage that went behind him, despite all the things he had done, he was God's apostle to the Gentiles. A walking, talking showcase of God's grace and his patience. That's how this whole section started. Paul thanking God for the opportunity God gave him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And he seems like the worst possible choice, doesn't he? Someone who's a Pharisee of Pharisees, who hates anything that's not Jewish, a persecutor, a blasphemer, a violent man, you could not have drawn up a worse person to send out to the rest of the world, except for one thing. He was an object of God's mercy. And for all of his past and all of his baggage, God could have just told him to sit in time out in the corner, but he so completely forgave him, he gave him a job to do. And he became an example of God's grace in action. Wow, we hate the clinging and clanging of those cans, don't we? We so badly want to wake up one morning and have everybody else see us the way Jesus sees us, completely forgiven. We so badly want to wake up one morning and not see our failures when we look in the mirror. We want to wake up one morning and not face the same temptations day after day after day, but we're not in heaven yet. We're the same time saint and sinner. And we are forgiven and we are holy and before God it's like it never happened and yet we live our lives at times surrounded by the consequences of our sins. And those sins drag behind us like cans clinging and clanging on the pavement. But there's a benefit there, isn't there? Because the louder they ring in our ears, the more we look to the cross. And the more we look to the cross, the more we see the beauty of God's grace. And then we consider this amazing thing that God has given us a job to do. And he could have picked someone better. He could have picked a better father, a better husband, a better mother, a better wife, a better friend, a better family member, a better neighbor. But he didn't. He chose you. And for all of our past and all of our baggage and all of our failures... We look to the cross and we see the beauty of God's grace. 
The fact that nothing we've done is bigger than what Jesus did for us. And it makes us exactly what Paul was. A showcase of God's mercy. Amen.